everyone. It's on the hour and we're going to go ahead and start our conversation. We're expecting a lot of people today and so we're going to try and uh, do some tech management to make this as smooth as possible for all of you. Um, as always, uh, we are excited to partner with the Rebus community on office hours. My name's Karen. I'm with the Open Textbook Network. These are monthly calls in which we discuss issues and practical considerations that you're all dealing with as you work in the OER space, um, creating uh, open textbooks and other resources. So today we're excited to have four guests with us. Um, they are going to discuss the invisible labor of OER, uh, which is probably near and dear to many of our hearts. Um, and then we're gonna continue this conversation in May when we will feature additional guests and talk about um, strategies for dealing with invisible labor and um, sort of um, hear some stories about people who've been there and how they approached it. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand things over to Zoe who will introduce our guests and facilitate our conversation. And we're excited to hear from all of you as well and, um, and explore these issues. So Zoe, please take it away. Thanks, Karen. Hi, everyone. It's really great to see so many of you here today. Thank you for joining us. Um, I apologize in advance a little bit. My voice is uh, on its way out and there may be some coughing, but I'll try to keep myself muted um, to help with that. Uh, so as always, we're, we're really pleased to be sharing this, uh, this time with our friends at OTN. Um, and this topic in particular, we're, we're really excited to, to bring into the Office Hours series. Um, and, you know, as we were planning this, we really started realizing that it's a very big topic. And this will be just one part of a conversation that is and should be ongoing within OER. So we're taking this first session to hear from our guests, all who have really interesting perspectives and experiences with this issue. Um, and then going forward, as Karen mentioned, into another session where we talk a little more about strategies to, to deal with these things as, as it's a very practical question to, to come up against these sorts of issues as we're working. A lot of it, you know, we'll be talking about our kind of systemic level issues. There aren't immediate solutions, but we want to make sure that we're talking about what we can. So we have a stellar group of guests um, that I'm really excited to hear from. Uh, first up will be Ali Verse Lewis, who is the OER librarian at the University of Guelph. Uh, following Ali, we have Melissa Ashman, who is uh, an instructor and the interim department chair of applied communications at Kwantlen Polytechnic University, NBC. Uh, following Melissa, we'll be hearing from Esperanza Zenon, who is a physical sciences instructor at River Parishes Community College. And then finally, we'll hear from Monica Brown, who is the OER coordinator at Boise State University. So I'll hand it over to Ali to get us started. And then once we've heard from each of our, our guests, we'll regroup and hopefully there'll be some good questions and discussion to come out because I think everybody will, uh, will have something to share about this. Thank you, Ali. Hey everyone, can you hear me okay? Awesome, okay. Um, so I've made some notes here just cause I wanted to cover a lot of ground in five minutes and didn't really wanna miss anything. So I thought what would be helpful for me um, and hopefully for you folks too on the call is just to give you a bit of an overview of kind of my role and the types of projects that I've been working on. And especially since there's gonna be so many folks on the call, I'd really like to, you know, I have some thoughts about labor and I can talk about the different types of invisible labor that I've done, but really I'm hoping that some of that really rich conversation comes out in the more kind of informal part of the discussion. Um, so hopefully that's okay. So as Zoe mentioned, I'm an OER librarian at the University of Guelph. Um, so in this role, I really um, educate and liaise with the university community on open content, licensing, and student-centered pedagogy. So in terms of kind of what that looks like, so I develop um, course-based and standalone workshops um, for both faculty and students um, that focus on finding open content, evaluating resources, um, and really helping them understand their rights um, with respect to um, kind of privacy in terms of the students' concerns um, and intellectual property as well, especially when we're thinking about um, student creation and we have a lot of faculty who are creating their own course materials as well. So kind of working with them to help them kind of understand what put 
putting something in the open actually means, what people can kind of do with that. Um, so there's kind of four main areas that I kind of focus on for my job. Um, so helping people who are interested in um, adapting OER. So I've been working a lot with a faculty member in um, the biological sciences to uh, migrate an OpenStax textbook into Pressbooks um, and updating some of that content, bringing in interactive elements, things like that. Um, and that project has involved um, folks who work in the library in the digital media studio, so some co-op students, a librarian that works in there. Um, so supporting folks who are just looking to kind of switch up their textbook or their other course materials, so finding openly licensed ma material that already exists out there that they don't really want to adapt at this point, they just want to kind of find openly licensed um, substitutions or things that might be available through the library as well. So not things that are technically open, but still things that are affordable. It's part of my job too. Um, and supporting open pedagogy projects. So there's an open pedagogy project that I'm working on right now um, with a faculty member in human health and nutritional sciences. And it's kind of this ambitious three-year project. There is a cohort of about uh, 16 students that go through um, an independent study course and these students are students who have already taken uh, a human physiology course and they are kind of um, taking kind of a retrospective approach and saying what would have helped me learn that material um, when I was taking this course so they are finding OER and then subsequent cohorts of students will kind of be pulling those resources together, um, fleshing out some of that interactive content, and at the end there will be an OER created from that. So that's a multi-year project, really rich, but we're really looking at it not only as an open project, but also an experiential learning project. So um, developing some different capacities in undergrad students when they're thinking about um, their role in the teaching and learning process. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we're helping folks migrate self-created content into more open formats. So we have a lot of folks who have already made their own course materials, which is super awesome, but it's living behind um, the LMS and it's locked up. So having conversations with folks about how we can make that kind of a more accessible um, resource, even if it's not kind of um, completely open in the way that um, uh, a perfect OER is. Um, before to, um, uh, it's worth noting too that this is a newish role to me. I've been in it since June and it's actually a secondment. So for those of you who don't know what that is, it's just a fancy way of saying leave. So I got to go on leave from my old job and try something new on, which is really exciting. Um, and it's a two-year position. So because this position is new to Guelph and I'm really figuring it out as I go along. I mean, I do have a job description, but like still figuring out what the heck I'm doing. Um, that is where I'm also seeing a lot of these implications for labor, um, not only because at the end of the two years, I kind of have to prove the value of this project and um, presumably that's gonna be kind of having some successful use cases that I can point to. Um, so I'm thinking about, you know, what is success? What can I point to in terms of projects? And I think that this also intersects with like my um, my role as an early career librarian. I'm on the tenure track, and as a person who has lots of diverse interests, I'm I already have a tendency to like do a lot of things and um, experiment with a lot of things. But I think because of this job, because there's kind of no roadmap that. Um, it's a bit challenging in terms of figuring out where I kind of should be focusing my labor and time and what kind of falls within the purview of other folks um, that I work with or other folks at the organization. Um, at the University of Guelph, we have a team-based model. So instead of having a kind of a liaison librarian, that's the librarian that does everything for, you know, math and chemistry, um, we have people in kind of functional roles, um, which is a bit challenging for an OER role because OER kind of doesn't really neatly live anywhere. It lives in scholarly communication, it lives in teaching and learning, it lives in copyright, it lives in accessibility, it lives in student success, it lives in all of these different areas and relies on a lot of different skill sets to support that work. So I have found it a bit challenging too um, when I'm thinking about labor to to think about like where my work and open work more generally kind of intersects with the expertise but also the workflow of other folks in those areas and in collections too um i'm trying to bring people into that conversation but it, it's it's challenging to figure out you know you're really kind of having conversations about values and workflow and dealing with like tradition and all of these really challenging things that impact what that work looks like and how it can be done so 
really all that to kind of sum up the things that I'm like thinking a lot about as I progress through this role is really like this idea of emotional labor. So um, whether that's working with my colleagues and figuring out how to not step on their toes, whether that is talking to students and assuring them about kind of what their rights are and thinking about privacy, um, whether I'm talking to faculty and kind of having those conversations that are like, open isn't as scary as you think, like, let me help you understand it. Um, so really those emotional conversations that I feel like are not often um, quantified or people don't understand um, just to the uh, degree and the amount that you have to do of those conversations. Um, and I'm also thinking about the labor kind of after creation. So it's all great to talk about creation or finding these objects, but um, who makes these things kind of discoverable, who is responsible for maintaining them. So we're thinking about grant programs, but we're not sure what that will look like. And we need to think about that discoverability aspects. And on a broader like macro level, thinking about where does this labor actually live? You know, I work within the library um, and it's great, I'm a librarian, um, but if we support this thing as an institution, but if the roles and the grants and the support structures are living in the library, how does it shape how this work is kind of understood or valued? So these are all of the things that keep me up at night. Excellent. Thank you for that, Ali. Uh, now I'll hand over to you, Melissa. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Okay. So um, my name is Melissa Ashman and I wanted to just begin with a land acknowledgement that I'm participating today from the unceded traditional and ancestral uh, lands and territories of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Musqueam and Kwantlen nations. Um, it's on the south coast of BC, uh, on the west coast of Canada, and I'm working at Kwantlen Polytechnic University, which is one of the leading institutions in Canada for um, zero textbook cost program. So I'm really fortunate, really lucky to be surrounded by colleagues who are just so enthusiastic and so open, no pun intended, about open education and open resources. So I came into um, open education and open pedagogy through textbook costs and um, having students come up to me and say, do I really have to buy the textbook? Do I need to buy this textbook? So I came into it from what can I do to support students to help them limit their textbook costs um, and not be a barrier to their education. But the more I sort of delved into it, the more um, I became really excited by the possibilities. And I'm now part of a working group at um, Kwantlen that helps in um, uh, assigning, uh, distributing rather uh, grants for other faculty to engage in open projects. I'm leading a, um, a working group within my department to develop some teaching resources. So, uh, and I'm also uh, redesigning my course assignments from an open pedagogy uh, perspective to um, make them more uh, renewable. So when I think about invisible labor, I think about in open, I think about the work that um, is not easily seen, um, is not by the naked eye. It's work that sort of gets done that's maybe undervalued or taken for granted, um, or maybe not recognized in formal university or college sort of tenure or promotion or recognition structures. So how can we recognize and acknowledge the contributions of students? How can we, what about sessional faculty or contract faculty in particular? Um, and what about um, something that Ali touched on as well, sort of that advocacy work and supporting others. Um, so I've been in this space for a year, year and a half now, and I've taken on an interim chair role within my department. So I'm really sort of starting to think about, from a leadership perspective, what can I do to help support others who may be doing a lot of work in open and how can I elevate the work that they're doing and support the work that they're doing and help connect them to others, um, get the recognition that they need. Um, uh, before I worked at Kwantlen, I worked at another large university in 
my area that shall rename <laughs> nameless. Um, and I heard anecdotally one day a story about a researcher, a faculty member who worked in community-based research who got passed over for promotion and tenure because her work um, it didn't look like she'd done enough or you know she'd published enough but she'd done so much work to connect with the community and to connect with others um, so i see a lot of similarities with open and people who engage in open um, how can we have these have this work recognized by universities and others so i don't have a lot of answers but it's something that i'm definitely starting to to think about and so i'm excited to participate in this uh, webinar today Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, and now I'll ask Esperanza to jump in. Hi. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. So I'm coming to you from River Parishes Community College in Louisiana. I'm nestled between New Orleans and Baton Rouge on the east side of the Mississippi River. Um, and my journey in OER is in some ways similar to what Ali and Melissa have described in terms of the, the, the work that has to be done. Um, my, I, I'm fortunate here that at this institution that our chancellor is very aware and very knowledgeable about OER and very supportive of this, of our college embracing this because it's being driven by our the, the college system in this state the community college system that we are that um, our courses are uh, textbook free by 23 that's the model that we're working under right now um, but unfortunately slogans don't get the work done right um, so i live in a space where i'm wearing so many different hats. Uh, first of all, I'm a faculty member. And um, I heard Melissa mentioning that part of her efforts are, is to redesign and restructure and embrace OER in her courses. I am also going through that process of developing my courses in an OER format. In fact, I'm ecstatic this morning because finally I got QM off my back. And one of my courses was going through a QM review and I finally got notified this morning that uh, it was given their, their blessing because we live by that standard here. QM is the standard we thrive for, we, we, um, you know, we, we use to gauge the quality of our online courses. And if a class doesn't pass that kind of review, it's not offered online here at this institution. But that in of itself takes a tremendous amount of work because unlike many institutions, we don't have instructional designers in our system. So there's nobody to go to and ask, what's the best way to do this? We're on our own to figure that out. And in fact, um, I also just finished a kind of a low budget uh, instructional design course that was offered through our system to try to train folk in our system to become those people that folk can go to when they need help. So um, that, that's another journey that I'm on as well. But, uh, you know, I, I teach anywhere from 12 to 14 classes a semester. So you couple that with what it takes to be uh, functional and moving this whole OER process forward. And that's a tremendous amount of work. And that's just part of what I do. I mean, I'm also involved in various other projects that are related to women in STEM and STEM equity. Um, and I'm also uh, part of na several national science or, uh, organizations. And I'm the newly elected president of the Louisiana Academy of Sciences in this state. So, I mean, I got hats galore. When you walk in my office, there's a rack. I need a, I need a hat rack for everyone, every hat that I put on during the day. But, um, in, in terms of being invisible, I, I, I think people know that the work is being done, but 
like my chancellor always says, when there's a task to get done, you'll only get about 20% of the, the same 20% always shows up to get things done. And, and I guess it, in that respect, I, I feel some of the, you know, the, the pressures of, of being invisible because this is an important pro project for our students. And, and you know, it, I guess I don't want other faculty members to remain invisible. I want them to step up to the plate. So uh, that's the kind of battle that we have here. We have the system and the high ups driving this process. You have only a handful of folks standing up to embrace this process. And yet, in a few years, this, this whole system has to be textbook free. Um, we need support of librarians as, you know, who are knowledgeable and functional in that area. Um, and, and more than anything, we need a process to make it palatable to folk, right? Um, so it, it, is, it is really, really a task. Um, so I, I was just thinking when I was listening to, you know, and thinking about, well, okay, well, can I jot down a list of some things that I've, I'm doing? I'm, all, I'm also part of the online review committee here that, that does review co the, the courses that are developed. So not only do I, am I developing my courses, not only am I trying to learn this whole OER process and get better at it, I'm also reviewing other folks' work for quality uh, on, on our campus. Um, conducting workshops. Uh, I go to various colleges in the system and talk about the Open Textbook Network and, and, uh, the res and various other OER resources and try to you know, is, is like one person at a time bringing them on board. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's the grind, really, you know, the, the, m building this OER um, mindset is a grind. Uh, and it's sometimes a lonely grind because there aren't many other folk willing to go to other colleges and train them and talk to them about this, this, this whole OER process. Um, don't, I don't, you know, I'm not trying to be mean or anything about it, but sometimes you face the situation when faculty are kind of stuck in their thinking that, that they've been doing it this way. They want to keep doing it this way. They don't want, they don't want to change anything. They, you know, they like it just like it is because it's easy. And my job in part is to help them embrace something that is hard. This is not, it's not necessarily easy work. I, we just got off spring break. And in over the course of five days, I built three, I had to have three courses built by the Monday morning that we walked in. Three OER courses. And that means literally I gave up spring break. I mean, I didn't get to go to Florida and hang out on the beach or something like that or you know, sip drinks with umbrellas or whatever it is that, that you do on spring break. I don't even know because I'm trying to grind out this OER process. And that's, that's in, nobody's looking at that, right? Nobody cares if you gave up your spring break to get this stuff done, just get it done, right? And so, um, grant, I heard grants being mission, mentioned. I'm the PI on one grant, I'm co-PI on two others, and I'm about to go after a third that, deal, that deals with OER. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking at grants from a, a lot of different perspectives, but also trying to reach out to faculty and say, we need you on board. Why don't you write a grant? What do you want to be able to do with OER in your courses? And, and trying to stimulate that interest in them, you know? I think there are three of us on this campus that are like grant hounds. You know, we go after any grant that's that that's out there that's related to OER. Um, but I'm also the PI on an NSF grant right now. <laughs> so um, I mentioned training. Uh, 
you know, not only am I training people, but I'm trying to find avenues to get better at this. And so, I mean, it, it, is, it is really a tremendous amount of work and I'm not, I'm not doing it for, because I, I want the glory or I'm doing it because in the end is it helps to make this institution better. And sometimes that's a lonely, that's a lonely uh, thought me mentality. I mean, that's a lonely place to be um, because you don't have a lot of other people that are thinking on that level. We have to do this because it's going to be good for the students and good for the institution. The first question is, what's in it for some folks? Sometimes nothing. There's nothing in it for you other than it needs to be done. So I'll leave it at that. Amazing. Thank you so much, Esperanza. I feel like I could have just spent the hour rattling off different job titles for you and we'd never get to anything. Uh, I have a question brewing and there's been some good chat already in the, um, in the, the chat, uh, but for now I'll hand over to Monica. Thank you. Hey everyone, I am from Boise, uh, Boise State University in Idaho, um, the place with all the potatoes, if you're unfamiliar with us. Um, and uh, my story into OER uh, came from being an adjunct. So I was an adjunct in first year writing, uh, so teaching English 101, 102, those introductory writing and research courses. So OER wasn't something I was cognizant I was even using, I just thought free and openly available resources should be in my course. I didn't have the language for it yet when I started teaching. Um, for me, it was always about it being simply good pedagogy. If I can increase access to the materials and those materials help my students produce their own writing, that's great. Um, so from day one, for me, OER is just a part of pedagogy. Um, but the difficulty comes in when you're an adjunct. So when you're an adjunct, a lot of that Pedago pedagogical prep, all of the course design, none of that is taken into account when you sign that contract that says you start on the first day of the semester, as if any of us have just walked into a course on the first day of a semester ready to start. Um, even with programs that have more structured curriculum for you to pick up, it's still a lot of prep that goes uncompensated for. So coming into the OER world, I came from course design and that process being just something you had to get done on your own time, on your holiday breaks between semesters, um, because it was a part of the gig and it was a part of doing a good service to students. Um, that is in extreme contrast to the role I actually occupy now. So I am a full-time professional staff member in our eCampus unit as the OER coordinator. That means I get to spend all day every day working on OER, which is pretty unheard of um, across the country at most institutions. Um, and the cool part of where I'm located um, is that I am nested within instructional design. And so I can help with the process of developing courses with OER right from the start. Um, and so I basically serve as a project management role where I can work one-on-one -on -one with faculty who are interested in using OER to put that into their course. I also help connect people to uh, grants that we have going on our campus. Our state board is very interested in OER right now. And that luckily means that our four-year institutions are being funded to support that work. So I'm often kind of playing matchmaker between faculty and resource, um, which is great. It's a great opportunity to be able to do that. And it's so shocking because a year ago I was developing courses on my own time with no funding for that same exact work. Um, so it's been really exciting to be able to be a person who gets to go to an adjunct faculty member and offer them the support, help searching, help finding the right technology that they can use and build into their course. Um, that same help that I was never offered when I was in their role. Um, so it's, it's a really cool setup, um, but it makes me acutely aware having come from this previous experience of the, the labor issues that are inherent within it. Um, some of the things that I've noticed um, is that this idea of risk taking, um, it's a risk sometimes to take OER. If you are a contingent faculty member, um, bucking the status quo in your department has consequences and those consequences are just not getting the first dibs on the next classes, not getting your contract re-signed. Um, 
So even if it's a good choice for your students, um, if the rest of the department isn't supportive, it can actually be a risk that involves you having to leave their, your institution. Um, and that's something we don't necessarily address as explicitly as we can as a community. And I think we can do more to have those conversations because so much of that first two years at the undergraduate level is taught by contingent faculty members who are already doing everything they can. And so to put the labor of reducing university costs back on them, to me, I have complications with that, at least without a lot of invested support. Um, the other thing I notice, even if we're thinking of tenure track folks who are um, doing scholarship, investing your scholarship time into OER instead of writing a textbook has particular ramifications for tenure processes. And I think that there is a unique risk that marginalized folks take on when they have to take that risk. So if everyone is kind of, you know, betting that it'll work out if I spend this time creating this OER instead of doing this textbook or this other form of scholarship, that risk is amplified for folks who have historically been barred from the academy. Um, their tenure portfolios are under greater scrutiny in a lot of ways because they deal with discrimination systemically throughout their entire career. Um, so those are a couple things that kind of come to the surface for me regardless of whether you're talking about a tenured faculty or an adjunct faculty. Um, the, the labor components there are filled with tension. Um, at my own institution, something else that I've really noticed is that we don't have, because marginalized folks are in a position in the university to create these resources because it comes at free labor to themselves or risk to themselves, um, we don't have enough access to materials that look at diversity, equity, and inclusion. We don't have those kind of critical examinations from underrepresented populations. And so I'm getting requests all spring um, for like our diversity courses and ethics courses and our first year writing courses and the materials aren't out there because the folks who would have to take that risk can are barely surviving the academy to begin with um, at least in in my experience that's what i've noticed so those are some things that i i've noticed and like they're not easy, <laughs> easy problems to solve, but I think it's important that we locate OER in a larger system of power and labor. Absolutely, I think that's that's a, a perfect note to end on there and, and what we're hoping to kind of do here. There are so many factors at play here. Thank you all so much for our, from, for our guests to our guests <laughs> for starting us off. Uh, I'll give people a bit, of a, a bit of time to kind of come through in the chat with any questions or any other kind of issues that they want to bring up. And I thought I, you know, I heard from both Esperanza and Monica this idea of just needing to get stuff done. And that that's, it's just a non-negotiable, it's an impulse that you have to, to get things done. And I wondered if either Melissa or, or Ellie wanted to jump in on, on that, if they've kind of had a, a similar feeling in, um, in the work that they've been doing. And then the other thing I was, I was wondering from you, Ellie, is it's, um, I wondered if you'd had similar experience to Monica of moving from doing OER work generally into a specific role that that's kind of brought a perspective for you. Um, so either of those, if, if someone wants to jump in on. Melissa, do you want to go first? Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so last summer when I wanted to adopt an open textbook, um, I looked at what available options were out there and there wasn't anything that sort of met my needs. So I sort of sat there and hummed and hawed and hummed and hawed and was like, well, what am I going to do? And what? Well, I guess I'll just do it. <laughs> like there, there, there wasn't anyone to draw on. So I just kind of secretly in the evenings for six weeks, eight weeks, sort of compiled, worked feverishly to do something, to prepare, to bring together multiple resources and then just kind of put it out into the world. And it was like, here we go. I just kind of did it. Um, because you know i didn't i didn't even know who to talk to who to connect with how do i go about doing this i guess i'll just do it myself because it's just not going not going to happen and um you know i really liked what monica was saying about um about the the risk in um 
developing OERs and engaging in that and making sure that the materials that we have reflect the, the populations and the people who are using, using them. Um, and a colleague of mine is taking the textbook that I developed, uh, adapted rather, and is, has got received a grant to um, incorporate Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous ways of knowing neurodiverse perspectives to really make sure that you know, we have a textbook that um, is representing what we need. Um, it's a step in sort of the first direction, but there's there's a lot more to happen. And, you know, it's just a matter of we needed to do it because we didn't know who else was going to. So um, I'll throw that back out there for whoever would like to respond. Thanks for that, Melissa. Just very quickly, uh, Esperanza has had to leave us momentarily. She just got a t tornado warning. Um, so we hope she stays safe and we'll, uh, we'll hopefully see her again, but obviously safety first. Uh, yeah, Zoe, so to answer your question about kind of just that challenge of just needing to get things done, I definitely feel that, especially because my role isn't permanent so there's no I'm hoping that they that they make it permanent but you know at the end of two years they could also yank away the funding and say okay our support for OER is going to look different it's not going to be one single point person we're like all taking this on as a library which would have its own benefits and challenges um I think a huge part of open work is establishing that community of practice and when you have when you're like the first person at your institution certainly what i'm seeing at our institution because oer is kind of newer work here um certainly not as established as it is in the states um that the couple of folks on campus who are really interested in it are you know like a little tentative so coming back to what monica was saying too that idea of risk taking and so a huge part of my role has also been kind of their like personal and cheerleader and being the person that's like I will help you navigate the weird press book stuff or like I will look into this I'll ask my like peeps on the listserv like just being like really like leaning into that other duties as assigned in my job description um which is good in terms of like kind of spinning up some projects and getting traction um and certainly that um adaptation that I spoke about earlier um that I supported um, in molecular and cellular biology. So I was helping a faculty member who was op adapting an OpenStax, the OpenStax microbiology text. Um, and she wanted to um, update some of the images in there. So I, I reached out to the folks in the digital media studio and we had some co-ops, librarian co-op students who were working in there. So they helped out. And that was really great to provide that support. And the reason that we did it really was like a test case to be like, if we're going to provide this support, how, what would that look like? How long would that take? How would that workflow look? And so there's definitely value in that, but I think it becomes challenging too, to like, once you kind of provide that service for someone, even if you kind of do say to them, like, this isn't a regular service, this is a one-time thing, there's still that expectation or they might tell other faculty members, you know, this is what the library helped with. And while that's great, it provides a, a lot of challenge in terms of like scaling things up, right? Because you need to like kind of moderate that workflow. So I definitely feel that pressure too, to just like try things out and just to do things. And sometimes that like has resulted in weeks where I'm just like, ah, I'm drowning because I'm helping these like four different people just try to find materials. We know that the resources that exist out there aren't always perfect and that not having that subject expertise means that it takes a bit longer to find those things um, and provide that support so I definitely feel that yeah for sure and I love that you mentioned the cheerleading too so in those weeks when you've got the four things all piling on you kind of I can imagine would still need to be staying very positive for the people that you're interacting with because they've taken a risk to do this work and so you're having to you know keep that that bright sunny face up so they're still excited about OER um, which is a lot of work when you're really kind of buried in it as well um, cool thank you uh so we we'll have a few questions coming in i know there's good conversation happening in the chat i'll pull out a question from deb uh deb who's asking is there a sense that textbooks published with a traditional publisher do count towards tenure while oer textbooks would not count 
and because I think Ting has been mentioned a couple of places here as one of those, you know, formalized ways to recognize work that is put into creating. Um, so if any of you want to jump in on that, that difference between traditionally published textbooks and OER. Certainly at my own institution, I don't think that, I get the impression from faculty that even publishing traditional textbooks isn't really valued because it's not seen as scholarship. So it's kind of servicey, but like different than committee work. So it seems like it lives in this very nebulous space where it's not really valued by most people. Um, I think certainly there's still the uh, misunderstanding that if you're involved in this open content creation, whether you're contributing a chapter two textbook or writing your own textbook. I think a lot of faculty still think like, well, it's not going to be peer reviewed. So it's definitely going to be sketchy when we know that that's not the case. Thanks for that. And I saw there was a question earlier that uh, had some good responses about exactly that, about the quality of OER as well and, and how peer review factors in, which still feels like an education um, kind of question. There were some good resources shared that we'll collect at the end about that too. Um, so then we heard from uh, April, and I know Monica, you answered this in the chat, but I might get you to, to share your answer, uh, asking whether you have suggestions as to how to document the invisible tasks that take place as instructional designers support faculty through the OER adoption process. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so documenting each project really thoroughly is something that I do. And so I don't really think, I don't really think there's going to be a template workflow that we'll always be able to adhere to. Um, so each project I treat individually and I take notes on every step of that process so that I can look back and say, oh, this project took 14 weeks and the faculty member was able to get it done in the last like three weeks because it was after the end of the semester. Like I take those notes so that I can really understand and what my support role is um, because I need to be flexible. I need to be meeting faculty where they're at, especially when I'm thinking about adjunct faculty who deserve all the support in the world. Um, so that, that's something that, that I do. I'm beyond using those notes, I'm not there yet, um, but I have been taking those notes and really keeping track of each project individually. Um, because what works for one faculty might work, not work for another. And I just wanna make sure that um, whatever support I'm providing is best for them. Almost like, you know, how you would approach supporting students, right? <laughs> um, some kind of question that I had, and I just wanna throw this out to the group and there's not like easy answers on any of this, but I'm wondering if there are ideas or thoughts around how we can use this OER movement to not add to the labor crisis in the university system. Um, because I think we're pushing for it and it's great, but how can we make sure that it doesn't fall disproportionately on people who are already structurally in this power system doing the best they can? So that's kind of a question that I have and I don't think there's like easy answers for it, but I wanted to throw it out there. Um, how, can we, how can we make sure that OER support isn't OER burden on top of an already heavy teaching load and you know, contingency? Anyone want to jump in on that one? Melissa or Ellie or anybody else in the in the chat? This is Kathy at Oklahoma State University. Um, I'm fortunate here to be a full-time OER librarian. And I, as I consider that, and I look at how busy my faculty and instructors are, I feel like one of the ways I can really help them is to know my end as well as possible to bring my instructional design chops to bear to really know our publishing platform so that ideally they can just vomit their subject matter expertise in my direction or hand me their syllabus or I can talk to students that have been in their courses and then I can maybe cobble together something then to bring to them and let them refine. Uh, but we're still we're still establishing a workflow. Monica, I heard you talk about how your role as a dedicated OER coordinator really makes a difference. And so it seems that that is a step in the right direction. The more sort of legitimacy and money and time that is carved out, 
um, will go a long way in making sure that people aren't just sort of adding on to their already extensive to-do list. Um, and, and it's such a, a wonderful question because of course this is happening in the academy, it's also happening everywhere. Just the expectations that we're always working, we're always you know, responsive, um, we're always sort of getting things done is very much embedded in our current culture. And um, there's not always, um, you know, the equivalent of a, of a tech paycheck with that in different industries or um, the acknowledgement that you're doing um, something uh, that, that's like immediately sort of glamorous or sexy to people like OER, you know, there's a lot to explain about it. There's kind of a lot, a learning curve. And so it just doesn't necessarily have the splash that I think sometimes people experience as a form of payment. Um, in our current culture. So um, related to your question, I wonder too, how much is, how much can be done in sort of that relationship with your dean or supervisor? Esperanza talked about how the chancellor has this vision. And I'm just thinking about, you know, um, your local leaders and if people out there have stories about, you know, I feel like my work is seen because my supervisor has done this or I had a raise or, you know, we took our job description from, you know, A to B. Um, but these other entrenched issues of, you know, uh, shunting work to sort of another class of um, staff and faculty and their rights and responsibilities, like there are so many things to unpack in this, um, in this topic. It's really um, daunting, but also um, really important. So. Uh, I put that, I sort of add on to your question and put that out there as well if people have stories to share. I think in terms of kind of valuing that work and advocating for it, I've been very lucky at the University of Guelph. Um, I have an awesome manager who is like always, you know, going to the mat for our team, which is excellent. But my position actually grew out of, um, about a year and a half of advocacy work that the library had done more generally. So when I started at the library on contract, heard rumblings that my, there are university library and the bot, the big boss, um, very interested in OER. So I started to explore that area, but was really doing it off the side of my desk and was kind of a third of my job. And I, because I had all these different areas, I felt like I wasn't doing justice to any of them. And we were on this committee, but it's, as I'm sure everyone on the call knows, getting committee work to push ahead kind of big mandates is really challenging, especially because committee work is just extra work often. Um, and I kind of went to my boss and said, like, if you really want to make, you know, I've been doing research and work and going to conferences in this area for a year, but if you really want this work to happen on campus, like you want adopters, you want people to be doing this, you need to have a dedicated person. I said like, it doesn't necessarily have to be me, but you need to allocate those resources to show that you're serious about it because otherwise it's just never ever gonna happen. Because again, you need to be that cheerleader. You also need to be the expert. You also need to be the connector. You need to serve so many different roles and it's impossible for anyone to do that on top of, a whole other job. So um, I know that that is not the case at all, but at Guelph, we were very lucky that that was kind of recognized by both my manager and upper admin as well to kind of create this position. Even if it is only temporary, at least it gives me kind of the bandwidth to kind of explore things more and to provide more support. Absolutely. Oh, sorry, Melissa, go ahead. I was just going to jump on and add to that, which is that, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm really fortunate to work at Portland University, where we have um, we have someone at high level administration who is a huge proponent of um, open education and has worked tirelessly, tirelessly to um, support the creation of three credentials at our university that have zero textbook costs. And there's been this sort of top-down push and support for open education um, but it's still been challenging you know to find other people at my institution within my department even who are doing this but there is that recognition um, there are funds given uh, at the university for grants um, to develop um, open resources open projects um, and I think that really having that top-down support um, is really, really 
has been really, really critical for um, our university to sort of emerge as a leader in this area. I see there's a lot of great chat uh, going on. I wanted to pick up on something that um, Jess shared, uh, saying that she's interested in the dynamics around who is doing the work and who is contributing back to the commons. Some have capital to create resources, some are in states with more money and more support staff, and some do not have any of that. And that was something that kind of I, I was thinking of when you were talking, Melissa, about you know spending your evenings writing a, a textbook. That's not something that, that everybody is able to do. And so what does that you know do in terms of who's able to, to do the creation, whose voices are involved in it? And you know, there was a comment earlier about about you know how do you show the quality of free textbooks and that sparked a thought for me of how do you show that they're not actually free to create um, and and then as Jess says not everybody is able to um, to, to have the, the support and the access to funding for that so what does that do I mean uh, this is not a question we can answer right here but it's a, a thought that occurred to me if anybody wants to bounce off that Um, I'll kind of jump in on Jess's point a little bit about giving back to the commons um, because we're talking about the labor of what does it take to get materials into my course for my students next semester. Contributing to the commons is another layer of labor. Um, it is not just as easy as uploading um, all the time and I think it's important that we recognize that that is another burden. Right? Not just compiling materials from my course or making materials from my course or revising them, but then where do I even give that back and how do I give that back? And honestly, why should I give it back? Right? And that is a very important question for marginalized folks because there has been historical entitlement to labor that we need to acknowledge. Um, if a faculty of color does a really great collection of resources and doesn't actually want to share that beyond their institution, there is nothing wrong with that decision. And I think that what I've just said is very counter to the OER culture as a whole. And so I know I'm taking a risk in saying that, but I do want to put it out there that we need to have respect for their labor and know that contributing to the commons is not implicitly an easy step for everyone. Um, we also, in as a kind of a vein with that as well as authorship, um, with the CC BY and rolling those things over, um, scholars of color have had their work taken from them, right? We know the hidden figures. So there are different implications in asking someone to give back to the commons. Um, so I would ask that as we have those conversations as a community, we're really cognizant of that because I think it's, it's under the surface there. And so it's part of making it visible, right? I really loved what you said, Monica. I think about this a lot in terms of like student labor as well, because I think especially if you have a course that has an open pedagogy component, that's all well and good and that's super awesome. But um, there also needs to be options for students who don't want to participate in kind of this public scholarship and these public conversations to still participate in the grade. Um, and because folks have all sorts of reasons to not feel safe or comfortable kind of putting their work out in the open. So yeah, I think it's important to recognize that at all levels of creation, faculty, students, like staff and the people supporting that work too. So I'm really glad you mentioned that, Monica. Absolutely. And we had a great question pop up from Kathy asking, is there a way for those of us who are full-time OER that they could help people like Esperanza and others who don't have the same kind of support and who are doing so much? Forgive me, I'm trying to find my place again. I, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I missed a whole lot. And, uh, help, help me out. <laughs> Uh, so we've, we've been hearing from a few people who have uh, institutional support and they have and have formal formal roles doing this work and so wondering about how when they have that time how maybe could they support someone like you who has the the hundred different hats and and um, and 
but not necessarily the same kind of on-campus support. I mean, I, I'm wondering if even to the level of if there are resources, you know, as, as Monica, you're documenting the process that you're going through with, with all of your um, course adoptions, that that maybe becomes useful to other people who don't have access to an OER coordinator on campus, or if there are other ways that we could share some of this knowledge around. Well, I'll just say on our campus, the library staff is invaluable. I mean, they, they are really our guiding lights in terms of helping us to um, curate the resources that we need to, to, to put these courses together and um, developing materials that can be just dropped into a course to help you meet certain goals those kinds of things really help a person like me who has a lot of things going on um, and sometimes feel it feels like a, a, a very limited time to get a lot done where OER is concerned. Those kinds of resources and tools and support are, I mean, that's, that's really what makes it possible for us. So, um, you know, having, that's the kind of thing that sometimes faculty like me, where we don't really have an instructional design background, we really need. Absolutely. And there was a great comment from um, Matthew in the chat that you already are by doing the work you do, hosting conferences, bringing people to talk at your school, sharing it out, creating knowledge and space for faculty who don't have OER in their job titles. I really like that. I think another way that's really helpful for folks who have kind of that that power and privilege, and I say that as a person who does have that power and privilege to have OER be the focal point in my job, I think a huge part of it is community building. And I don't just mean, you know, being on listservs and like pushing resources out. I think a huge part of the thing that I found really valuable um, is connecting with people who can kind of acknowledge the more frustrating and crappy things that happen when you're doing this work all the time and um, sometimes like being vocal about those things right like being vocal about those frustrations and sharing those things that don't work I think that also creates um, I try and be really like visible about that in my work and in like my public persona on Twitter at conferences like acknowledging those harder things too um, because not only do you, not only do I think that that like builds up that rapport um, it also makes people feel less like isolated in their work. So if you are struggling with something, you know that like, it's honestly, maybe not you. It's maybe just that there's like not a tool that has that functionality and the workaround is really time consuming and it sucks. Um, and so being honest about that, I think is really helpful, especially for those folks who just have it as part of their jobs to just be like, okay, it's not just me. It's not that I like don't know how to do the thing. It's that there's not a tool that exists to do that. And I think like what you said, Zoe, also being those resources and those people who are supporting. So being on the listserv, being willing to share time and ideas. Um, and even just to like be a person that listens when someone is like, this thing sucks. And you're like, yes, it does. Let's talk about it. <laughs> just showing that empathy and that support. And validation. I think validation can go a really long way. Um, and then, you know, but even before you move into trying to find a solution to anything, it's, it's about knowing that, that it is a, a really shared experience that so many of us have in this community. Okay, great. So we're approaching the hour. Um, so I might, uh, Karen, was that a, an unmuting to start wrapping up? Oh, I just uh, wanted to uh, acknowledge and appreciate what Ali said and what everyone has said about emotional labor being such a huge part of this work and um, also in teaching in general. And um, I'm currently working with um, a team of people, probably a few of whom are on this call, on developing slides for the upcoming LPF uh, OER publishing workshop. And almost every section ends with what can go wrong and self care because it's just, you know, you share best practices and then you kind of feel like, oh, they're best practices. This is, a, this is the recipe for success. 
And so just acknowledging like, no, <laughs> even these best practices, you know, here are different things that may unfold and acknowledging that so that when you are alone in a room trying to uh, host a workshop, you can kind of fall back on, I'm not the only one who's felt this before, or had this experience. So um, I just really appreciate that. So I also really appreciate our four guests for joining us and the very active conversation in this call. And um, just wanna say again that we're gonna continue this conversation in May. We'll talk more about strategies. We hope as many of you um, as possible can join us again uh, to keep exploring this issue. So Zoe, I'll hand things back to you. Thanks, Karen, and I'll just echo the same. Thank you to our guests and everybody who shared questions and comments in the chat. I saw a note asking whether the chat can be shared as well. Um, I think we'll say yes, but if anybody would like to be anonymized, um, please reach out and we can do that. Uh, and I, another reflection I'm kind of having here is I think there's something about the phase that we're at with OER that is bringing a lot of these, these kind of issues to the fore and that it takes the work of, you know, to use the terminology of early adopters or, um, you know, the, the people who've gotten in uh, to really drive things forward. And that's a lot of work and it's really valuable work and we have to be, you know, bonded together to... To, to make it happen and, and to not burn ourselves out while doing it. Um, so I'm really, really looking forward to our next session as well. There have already been a bunch of great ideas in the chat that will move forward and we hope to see you all there again very, very soon. Um, so thank you, everybody. Farewell.